What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys and gals, what's going on? Don't ever wait for your doctor to order blood tests. With Private MD Labs, you can get your blood test prescription online in under one minute and go directly to over 4,000 lab locations in the United States. They offer every blood test imaginable at affordable prices with highly accurate results from tried and true state-of-the-art blood testing diagnostics. In fact, I've been using Private MD Labs for more than a decade. Their blood tests are much more in-depth and accurate than any at-home pinprick or worthless saliva test. Skip the intrusive doctor questions and get the exact tests that I recommend. Be proactive and get your panels today. Go to privatemdlabs.com forward slash JC to take 15% off your order. Send you guys love and light. Ladies and gentlemen, what is going on? We're back. This is part two of the podcast with Dr. Keith Nichols of tier one hw.com that's tier one health and wellness.com and on the first part of this we discussed the difference between testosterone optimization and uh using therapeutic testosterone or testosterone replacement therapy and then we also talked incredibly in depth and what I think was probably the best discussion ever on a podcast regarding uh the big myth of testosterone therapy with in regards to causing prostate cancer. So today, Keith and I are back uh, to cover the last two big myths. And the first one is testosterone optimization and erythrocytosis. Now, let me just say that to this day for me, uh, and Keith is you know, doing this every day in his clinical practice, it is still the most misunderstood concept on the planet. Not just, as you know, Keith, with in regard to men on hormone and women on hormonal optimization, but just in medicine in general. In medicine in general, correct. You, you see so many men over phlebotomized, okay? You know, again, bloodletting, you know, professionally recommended by clinicians, clinicians, recommended by therapists, recommended by God knows all sorts of people in the, you know, allopathic and functional medicine community. So obviously we're going to, we're going to set the record straight. This is going to be obviously a very important, critically deep conversation about this, but talk about why the majority of physicians and of course even their patients now who have been lied to and brainwashed because they don't know they just don't know better don't understand what is going on with this well jay remember in our our part one on testosterone and prostate cancer we talked about how for decades men were deprived of testosterone due to the misinterpretation of the literature yep, yep. well the same occurs with regard to the secondary erythrocytosis from testosterone therapy right so let's right. talk about that. So this is a, a review article that I'll be uh, that I'm in the process of writing on testosterone therapy and the secondary erythrocytosis. But look, Jay, you, you you no matter where you go, whatever clinic you go to, wherever you're online, you see men are concerned about their hematocrit all day long. They just they're always you know uh, worried about that hematocrit, right? Okay. Well, let's talk about where that all comes from. All right. The most common side effect of testosterone therapy and the one that causes the most concern for the patient and their family doctor, of course, is the secondary erythrocytosis from testosterone, which is an increase in red blood cells. All right. It's which, often, by the way, is good. It's good. You know, it's often described, though, by the patient and their family doctor as thick blood requiring right. a blood donation or phlebotomy, because if they don't, they fear it could possibly lead to a heart attack, stroke, right, or of course. Heart, correct? All right. Well, we talked about where the fear of prostate cancer originated, but where does this fear originate? Right. Well, when the family physician or the internist sees an increase in red blood cells along with hemoglobin and hematocrit, it is frequently misinterpreted as the patient having polycythemia vera. Now, polycythemia vera is a myeloproliferative neoplasm of the bone uh, marrow. It's a bone marrow cancer. Blood clots or thrombosis are a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in this disorder. Now, uh, now polycythemia vera is actually 
known as a primary erythrocytosis, where there's an unregulated proliferation of stem cells that lead to an increase in red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, okay? In polycythemia vera, in contrast to the secondary erythrocytosis from testosterone therapy, not only is there a quantitative change in the number of circulating blood cells that lead to procoagulant characteristics. In other words, in polycythemia vera, there's an increase in red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And these cells that are overproduced have a tendency to want to clot. They're not normal. Okay. That's not seen with testosterone therapy. All right. In addition, there are abnormalities involving the vascular endothelial cells, which also become procoagulant in response to inflammatory stimuli. So these two abnormalities result in a hypercoagulable state leading to an increase in arterial thrombosis and venous thrombosis. Therefore, part of the recommended treatment is blood donation to re reduce the risk of clotting. Now, the risk of an elevated hematocrit seen in patients with polycythemia vera cannot be extrapolated to hematocrit elevation seen during testosterone therapy, Jay. They're not the same and they should not be treated as such. Once again, let me summarize. In polycythemia vera, a primary erythrocytosis, a bone marrow cancer, the cells that are produced want to coagulate. So, and the vascular endothelium is not normal. Those abnormalities do not occur in the secondary erythrocytosis from testosterone therapy. Right. With testosterone therapy, there is an increase in red blood cells only, and it does lead to an increase in hemoglobin and hematocrit. Now, you know, I don't know how much you studied all this, but, you know, there's various mechanisms, uh, you know, postulated as to why testosterone increase red blood cells. But, right. you know, it's not completely understood, but it's thought that it could be stimulation of erythropoietin, uh, stimulation of progenitor cells, yeah. marrow yeah. and reduced hepcidin. But there's various mechanisms that will cause that. But a secondary erythrocytosis, like with testosterone therapy, is also seen in several other common conditions like smoking, obstructive sleep apnea. Right. Okay. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and living at altitude. Living now, at 6,000 feet. That's right. Now, while a primary erythrocytosis like polycythemia vera is a well-established risk factor for thromboembolic events, right. the risk of a secondary erythrocytosis has not been shown to cause an increase in thrombo thromboembolic events in any randomized control trial or prospective study to date. Let me right. repeat that. Testosterone therapy and the secondary erythrocytosis from it has never been shown to cause blood clots in any randomized controlled trial or prospective study to date. Now, most guidelines recommend following hematocrit after you start testosterone. And if the hematocrit exceeds 54%, clinicians should either adjust the testosterone dose, stop the therapy, or order a phlebotomy, or recommend a combination of those, all right? Now, these recommendations, Jay, are based on assumptions and right. the hematocrit cutoff of 54 percent was arbitrarily chosen and it right. wasn't based on any studies showing harm when this value was exceeded with testosterone therapy right the upper limit of normal for hematocrit really in most laboratory ranges for healthy adult males is 54 percent and that's where they likely derive that number from right so let's repeat that that number arbitrarily chosen it wasn't that exceeding has ever been shown to be dangerous it has not right. okay so this is the normal level of hematocrit up to 54 percent for men without a secondary erythrocytosis all right it's not for men on testosterone or living at high altitude for instance right jay there are over 80 million people that live at an altitude higher than 2500 meters right and they develop a secondary erythrocytosis that's right men's in parts of bolivia for instance men in parts of bolivia they have a normal hematocrit from 45 to 61 percent. Right. That's a normal hematocrit for those men that live at altitude, 45 right. to 61 percent. Those men are not at an increased risk of thrombotic events, nor do they have, nor do they have to undergo phlebotomies to manage their hematocrit, right? Okay. So one can also not ignore the observation like we did with testosterone and prostate cancer. You can't ignore the observation that literally tens of thousands of men presently use and abuse testosterone in this right. country and have done so for decades, right, Jay? We know plenty of them, right? 100%.
a majority of those men are not even under the supervision of a physician or getting lab work. Yep. And yet we haven't had an epidemic of heart attacks, strokes, or blood clots, just like we haven't had an epidemic of prostate cancer. And we never will. Right? Almost all previously reported cases of testosterone treatment that related that caused a venous thromboembolism were in patients with an undiagnosed thrombophilia, like factor five yep. light deficiency, not yep. in normal men. Okay. Yep. All right. So the main other concern, okay, let's just say a person says, Hey, Jay, I know I don't have polycythemia or bone marrow cancer, but it's the viscosity. My blood will get thick as mud and that's what's going to cause my problem. Right. Well, let's talk about that. So the other concern is the increase uh, viscosity because they fear that it's going to decrease blood flow and result in thrombotic events. Where does that come from? That comes from experimental studies using rigid glass viscometers, viscometers or cone plate viscometers, where there is a logarithmic increase in viscosity with increasing hematocrit. Okay. It is inappropriate, Jay, to right. correlate these in vitro viscosity readings to what occurs to flowing blood through tiny distensible vessels in vivo. Right. In other words, viscometer measurements in these experiments do not translate to human blood vessels. Right. Jay, Viscosity experiments losing a rigid tube, a rigid glass tube, does not equate to what occurs in a blood vessel. Right. Right. That's where that fear comes from. Firstly, the flow through these narrow blood vessels is rapid. There's a high shear rate, which in a non-Newtonian fluid such as blood causes a marked decrease in viscosity. Right. A Newtonian fluid like water, there's a constant viscosity when pressure is applied to it, for instance. But with blood, it's a non-Newtonian fluid. When shear stress is applied to it, it's, it has a shear thinning effect. Right. So the viscosity lessens. Okay. All right. So that's one thing. All right. With a secondary erythrocytosis that you get with testosterone, there's also an increase in blood volume. It doesn't occur with a normal blood volume. All right. That increase in blood volume enlarges the vascular bed and decreases peripheral resistance and increases cardiac output. Right. Therefore, whenever you have a secondary erythrocytosis, optimal oxygen transport with increased blood volume occurs actually a higher hematocrit, J than with normal blood volume. So a moderate increase in hematocrit may be beneficial despite the increased viscosity. Yep. So, you know, people tend to take a myopic view when they look at testosterone and the secondary erythrocytosis. They only focus on viscosity. But I've right. explained that... What happens in an experimental study has never been shown to occur right. in a human study with right. testosterone, just right. like we talked about prostate cancer. Right. They also ignore that testosterone exerts multiple beneficial effects on the vasculature and its components, right. which may actually protect against thrombosis. In other words, I say it all the time, testosterone has a positive effect on vascular reactivity. Testosterone is right. a vasodilator. It increases right. nitric oxide. Right. Testosterone decreases plasma concentrations of procoagulatory substances. Right. Testosterone improves erythrocyte membrane lipid composition and fluidity. Testosterone increases red blood cell deformability. It also decreases levels of lipoprotein A. So look, Jay, it's never been shown. Testosterone has never been shown in any randomized controlled trial to date to cause an increase in major adverse cardiac events. And well, also- Keith. I want to add something. I want to add something to what you're saying because remember, before we knew all this, before you know, Neil went deep and down the rabbit hole and figured all this right. out with the research right. of elevation. You and I and people like us would always tell guys that were on injectable testosterone that you know usually showed the greatest increase in, in red blood cell and, and, and oxygenation to do your cardio. And yeah. cardiovascular exercise does a lot of the things that you just reiterated about increasing and decreasing and doing all these things to clear the vascular pathways. And you never had guys who did cardio that would have this, you know, lethargy, this thickened blood, you know, this, you know, lack of energy or whatever they say. And, 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 and so I think it's important that yeah, yes, we don't know that it, that's not as important as we thought, but there's a, there's a correlation there. There really is. Well, you know, and I think the thing, Jay, that, 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 that the funniest thing is that, you know, these guys think that when they donate blood, that it's going to lower their hematocrit and it's going to protect them from some perceived harm that has never occurred. But it's in reality, in reality, 
you know, when you look at a study that was done over a two year period of time where they looked at men that were on testosterone that donated yep. blood, yep. at least a quarter of them had a hematocrit of above 54%. Yeah. And yeah. when they came back for repeat donations, 44% of them had persistent elevation above 54%. Yeah. So it just, it, it essentially showed that repeat donations are insufficient to main, maintain a hematocrit below 54%. Yep. So my point in that is, is that they, they're doing that and they think that they're lowering their hematocrit when in fact, most of them are not. But yep. once again, even those men, it's just never been shown to cause harm. You know, Neil Rizier was great about saying this when it comes to the increase in hematocrit with, uh, with testosterone therapy. You know, people will say, well, it might. It might call. You don't know. It might cause a heart attack, stroke, or blood clot. Right. Now, wait right. a minute. Now, wait a minute. Like Neil says, in medicine, when somebody says it might do something, that right. means it doesn't. Because <laughs> if it had been shown to do it, we would say that it you does. Already know. Now, right. wait a minute. Testosterone has been used clinically since 1937. Yeah. What are we talking about? 80 years of use now? Literally. I think if it caused yeah. harm, would we know it by now? I think we can get over saying that it might, okay? Because not only is it used, but is it has been abused for decades, yep. and we're still not seeing those issues in men that even abuse it, Jay. Yep. So that's the that's the real issue is that it's once again another testosterone replacement therapy myth that was based on another condition and extrapolated to men with that have a secondary erythrocytosis. But once again, we're not taking all the hundreds of millions of people that are living at high altitude and making them donate blood to decrease their risk of heart attack, strokes, or blood clots, right? We're not doing it because it doesn't nope. happen, right? Exactly. So it's just one of those other TRT myths that people will argue all day long. And what I always say, please, it's been used since 1937. When it was first used, for instance, Jay, the first couple of decades, there wasn't even a test for it. people. To, it was not right. readily available. It was expensive. Right. So men were just given testosterone to resolve their symptoms, you know, of hypogonadism. Right, of course. And yet still no increase in heart attack, strokes, and blood clots. And even in men that were given testosterone and, and not even measuring blood levels, just like today, men that are abusing it, not getting blood levels and not having an increased risk or an epidemic for heart attack, strokes, or blood clots. So it's just another TRT myth. Uh, that that well, uh, well, so let's unpack this further because that was great information. But now let's go deeper because you know the people are going to ask the question. So, and again, we have to call people out. We have to call people out. But why is over phlebotomizing a man actually far more dangerous and deleterious than not doing so? I wish I could tell you the number of men that transferred their care from another clinic to me that came in with severe fatigue and couldn't understand why. But yet they had higher deficiency in the and they were just they were they were miserable. You know, look, Jay, there's a reason that our Olympic training facility is in Colorado Springs, which is higher than a mile up. Okay, it's to it's to cause the secondary erythrocytosis that gives them yes. an advantage at, yes. at sea level. All right. And so, you know, why anybody would want to donate blood and lose that beneficial effect, Probably. I don't know. But once again, I, I can't say this enough. They do it based on a fear. Right. It's all that has never been shown in the medical literature, no different than the prostate cancer. So they can keep doing it. They will argue with me and you to their to their blue in the face. But yet they can't show any single study where it has ever showed harm. Dude, ever, ever. It's insane. I mean, I mean, these guys, I mean, again, I, I don't even know where to say it. I mean, well, but so that so, so let's 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 just give the numbers real quick again. So can you quantify again for the people that just don't get this? Where is a number of both hem hemoglobin and hematocrit when you're truly in a level that there should be concern that you might have polycemia or polycythemia vera or anything? Polycythemia vera, you're going to see an increase in red blood cells, right. white blood cells, and right. platelets and platelets right. clot. Okay. Right. But right. once again, polycythemia vera, if you pick it up, they are prone to clot because they're not normal cells and you're not dealing with a normal vascular endothelium where you are dealing with normal cells right. when you're dealing with a secondary erythrocytosis. But do, will so, you see a specific level that, you know, again, I know there's no cookie cutter numbers, but do you, is there a number where, you know, so if somebody's watching this and they don't understand anything you and I are saying, I mean, but they understand the numbers and they know when their docs are saying, oh, you're too high, you know, you're at 52, you got to give blood. Is there a number that you see for somebody that truly is at risk for polycythemia vera. No, no, you polycythemia vera is is a, is, a, is 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 a totally different condition.
Hey guys, what's going on? If you're looking to level up your life from a mind, body, and spiritual perspective, join the Fully Optimized Health private membership group today. There is no better place online to discuss hormones, peptides, fitness, fat loss, supplements, and even raising your consciousness with an elite tribe of men and women. You also get to speak to me directly every single week in the Ask Me Anything. Join today. Go to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up, and I'll see you and talk to you soon. So, what well, no, no, I know that, but I'm just saying, like, when that is the condition, are there specific numbers? Well, I think what you're asking then is do I see someone with a secondary erythrocytosis that doesn't have polycythemia there right. that comes in? What level of hematocrit would give me alarm? Exactly. That's what I've I'm never to. seen an elevation above 60, for instance. Okay. I've seen, <laughs> but you know, also, you could, you know, if you're not adequately hydrated at the time, it's going to affect. That's right, too. As well, Jay. Right too. So what we will do a lot of times is that say, look, it's never been shown to cause harm, you know, but, you know, you might if you your family doctor is going to have a have a panic attack. So you might want to go donate blood before you see him so that so that, you know, he doesn't have that. You know, and that that's the key. But but Jay, I mean, we've been doing it for over a decade now. Others have been doing it just as long, if not longer. With doc and none of us have ever seen right. it cause harm, as no study has never shown it to cause harm. I guess you asked me the question that what if you and I went to live at altitude? Right. Say, okay, we went to just mean you just moved to Peru. Say to my father. Yeah, yeah, we might we might we end up doing it anyway. All right. And so, when would you and I get our blood? you know, hematocrit measured. And when would you and I decide, you know, man, my hematocrit's up to 58. Uh, Jay, yeah. I think I may ought to go donate blood here at Machu Picchu. Never. We wouldn't do it, would we? No. We wouldn't do it. We wouldn't even think about it. No. Nope. Wouldn't even think about it. No. Nope. So have you ever been able to get a family doctor? Like, have you ever had, I know it's a waste of your time, but have you ever been able to actually tell somebody who was so on the other side and then have this same conversation with them and get them to reverse their beliefs? No. Not one time. No, no, no. They're so entrenched in the, and they're so entrenched in the, you know, in, in their belief because we learned it that way. But really, if, if they would allow me, that's why I'm writing the review article. That's right. why I'm writing the review article is so that I can provide it to the, to, we'll call them our colleagues to try to explain to them that, that they're, they're concerned about a condition that these patients don't have. Right. And, and, and that they don't have the same sequela, the medical sequela that a person with polycythemia would have. But they immediately think that's that. And then the next argument, it was, what about the viscosity? Well, once again, <laughs> once again we've explained the viscosity. We've explained how it all works. And I'm going to tell it again, as Neil Rizier would say it. When you say that it might, it means that it doesn't. Because right. it's been used long enough that if it did, we would say that it does. Right? Unbelievable. I mean, how many years? I want to ask this last question. How many years are we going to have to use testosterone before medicine will admit that it's a safe hormone Are we right. going to for 150 years probably so another 50 years key since 1937 and yet it's never been shown to cause harm but yet we still think that it does it's amazing, I, don't, dude. I don't understand that jay i, I literally uh, uh, it boggles my mind to realize that that people still want to vilify it and think that it's harmful, but it's never been shown to cause harm. Well, you know, look, you know, we're going to switch to the, the last bullet point here in a second because it's even it's bigger than probably the other two combined. And, you know, it's stuff that you and I answer every day. But I mean, the reality is. Who we have to blame is the physicians and we don't blame the physicians like the family docs and the HMO and the PPO guys, because you know how they live their life. It's every five minutes insurance. Boom. But it's other guys that I could name that I won't. Very famous guys in the optimization community who are still telling their patients to get phlebotomized. That those guys cannot escape anymore. If you are a man watching this podcast and you are working with those guys, and there's one on the right, the right coast and the left coast, that's where I'll go. And they're telling you to get phlebotomized. Don't do it. As Keith said, get a second opinion. It's literally that simple. Jay, really we have to, you know, we have to thank the men, thank the men like Abraham Morgenthaler and the right. Neil Reese Gays of the world that literally questioned right. the status quo, that right. questioned dogma and said, wait a minute, right. 
let me look at what the medical literature right. actually shows. Yeah. And when you go take a look at that, like I have now done, I have spent years now <laughs> right. with articles on secondary erythrocytosis and estrogen and, and prostate yep. cancer. And look, yep. when you really take a good look, you realize that there's these, there nothing. are these false alarms based on nothing that's ever happened. Right. Right. I'll right. tell you where, where the confusion lies. And let me just make this real statement really quick is that the confusion lies with a lot of people. I'm going to do a presentation on this. I'll even do it for your show the first time if you want, but I've got the slides already, but look, the confusion lies here. The FDA put a black box warning on testosterone right. in 2015 saying that yep. it might increase the risk of heart attacks. Strokes, and might. Right. Now that was based and they actually put it out there. Anybody can pull it up. That was based on two extremely flawed studies that came out. In Tom, the Tom trial. Yep. No, it, was, it was the vegan and the Finkel studies. They were oh, all Finkel study. studies. Okay. The FDA did not know those studies were so flawed when they put that black box warning on there. I will tell you that those two studies have basically been totally debunked by the medical community. Yeah. Right. That's where the confusion lies. With that said, testosterone has been used since 1937. It has never been shown in a single randomized control trial, and there have been thousands to date to cause any major adverse cardiac events. Yep. Thousands of studies over decades, it still has not been shown to cause any major adverse cardiac events in any randomized control trial. And when I show yeah. the studies and then we dissect the studies, the vegan and the Finkel studies, you'll understand that, well, well those, those studies were, were totally trash and they were observational studies, not randomized control trials. In comorbid population groups, correct? Well, the Tom trial, there were the men were co very morbid, uh, co morbid, but uh, but in the vegan and the Finkel trials, it was just it was just it was just bad data. Bad Extrapolation data. does not equal causation, correct? Right. Well, I'm going to go through those studies and I'll present them as they are, and then I'll present the flaws in the study and how they were completely debunked, and and people will understand. But but other than those two, there there's no actual nothing, uh, nothing. Random, nothing. But yet you hear that it does. It's just the medical literature has never shown that it does. Right. So that's my frustration. That that is my that is my frustration with 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 everything is that is that you know you know you we need to listen to more brilliant men like, like Morgan Toller and, and Rousier in that they and, and look I have spent my time just every day literature 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 trying to find something and it's not there. Well, give yourself credit, dude. You're one of those guys. Okay, final topic here, which is obviously near and dear to our heart, and yes. I have spent just as much time writing about this as you have yes. researching it. And yes. it doesn't matter, Keith, no matter what we say. So, I mean, hopefully today will be like our final statement other than the book, you know, on this, it is absolutely insane. The idea that men are still inhibiting natural biological pathways and hormonal cascades as they think due to bodybuilders or wherever it came from. And there's probably a million reasons and you probably know all the reasons of where it came from, but the, the idea that you should be managing or blocking estrogen and dihydrotestosterone is insane. Anyone still doing that today with you as a patient, leave, fire your doctor, immediately go work with someone else. And Keith, why is that? How much harm are these people doing to their biological systems by inhibiting these new, these, these biological pathways? You're literally diminishing the effects of testosterone itself. And we're going to talk about all that, you know, now, once again, we talked about testosterone and prostate cancer and the misinterpretation of the literature. We've talked about testosterone and raising and uh, increasing hematocrit and the misinterpretation of the medical literature. We've talked about that. Here we go again, another TRT myth. Let's start by just saying this, first and foremost, there's not a single randomized control trial right now with testosterone that shows benefits in men where they block estradiol. I just got back from the Androgen Society meeting where the world's leading urologists were there. We're looking at studies where testosterone- Never. Studies that have Never. not even, studies that people haven't even seen yet is being presented Never. at this, this conference. And so I'm looking at all these studies where we're treating men with prostate cancer with high doses of testosterone. We're treating men with active surveillance. We're treating men with diabetes and insulin resistance. And we're looking at all these wonderful paid studies, 13 year studies where these men are having their type two diabetes completely reversed by testosterone. As you and I have talked before, 
in every single study presented at the Androgen Society, for instance, in all those studies showing the benefits of testosterone, ranging from prostate cancer to type 2 diabetes and everything else, not a single one of those studies using aromatase inhibitor. Insane, dude. But yet, but yet, it's still done in practice. All right. Now, let's think about a couple of things here. The normal range for estradiol that men like to look at, let's say it's around 8 to 35, I believe, at LabCorp for sensitive estradiol test. That is not the normal estradiol level for a man with good testosterone levels. Right. For a man with low testosterone levels. When you take testosterone or make testosterone, it travels down three pathways. The direct pathway is essentially the muscle tissue. We all know that. That's why bodybuilders want their levels to be as high as they can be because it will increase lean muscle mass. All right. The other two pathways are the diversification pathway and the amplification pathway. So testosterone, when it reaches target tissues, it will convert into either estradiol, which is the diversification pathway, or the DHT, the amplification pathway. Now, in all the areas that you know that testosterone provides us with such wonderful benefits, the brain, the bone, the heart, the blood vessels, your sexual function, testosterone essentially acts as a pro-hormone. It has to be converted into its active metabolites, DHT and estradiol, to exert its beneficial effects. So when a man blocks estradiol or DHT, they are essentially blocking the beneficial effects of testosterone at the tissue level. Now, when they're measuring estradiol and DHT, they're essentially measuring what is produced peripherally, not what's produced at the tissue level where you get the benefits from. So estradiol, for instance, mainly what you're measuring there is produced in the adipocytes, the fat cells. It doesn't have an endocrine function, okay? So when men block estradiol to get to have their adipocytes, fat cells, stop producing estradiol, what they are in fact doing is blocking testosterone's conversion to estradiol at the tissue level where they get all the benefits. Right. Therefore causing long-term harm. It's a slow kill. It's not an immediate kill. People say, oh, I wouldn't do anything to kill, kill my patient. Look, it's a slow poison, my friend, a slow poison, my friend, because you can't provide any study where giving estradiol to, I mean, giving testosterone to a man and blocking estradiol provided us with benefit. But so Keith, what, there are studies that show the opposite of that. As you they, know, you they, and they Scott do. have shown that for Absolutely. literally six or seven years. So right. I want it to be, I want to hammer this. It is shortening your lifespan. Listen, the bodybuilders. Diet, question. Look, here's what happens. It was a great idea for a bodybuilder to say, hey, I want to block my estradiol right. so I have more free testosterone. Remember, it goes right. down three pathways. You block any of those other pathways. You block DHD. Right. You block estradiol, right. you will increase free testosterone, increase lean muscle mass. It right. worked for that. It worked. Great idea. The problem is you're going to suffer the consequences. Yes, look at are. bodybuilders. They look great on the outside, but they die from the inside out. Fatty right. liver, fatty heart, you know, you name it. Full of fat. Why? From the blocking of blocking. the estradiol. That's Keith, I got to ask you, I got to put you on the spot because it's time for that. And we've already talked about this. I, have, I won't mean name names, but have every single one of these guys that have died in, say, the last three to four years, and, and you guys that know the industry, did they all die from blocking their estrogen? That's how you get the – that's that's one of the big causes. They were all on aromatase inhibitors, and that's one of the big causes. That's a, you, You're losing the beneficial effects of testosterone. Now, look, they're also abusing multiple other – you know, yeah, we know that. Growth hormone, and, you know, you right. can name all that, but look – when it comes to the premature cardiovascular disease and all right. that, they're they're using non-aromatizable anabolic steroids. Right. And when the ones that they do take that aromatize the testosterone, they're blocking the estradiol. So they're getting no benefits Nothing. that they need. Look, you need aromatizable uh, androgens right. in order to get right. the benefits of the androgens. So here's what guys don't understand. If we could just take guys from around the world that had the highest testosterone levels we could find, no matter where right. they were, right. they would have an estradiol that reflected that higher testosterone level because testosterone's beneficial effects come from estradiol. So the higher the testosterone level, the better your estradiol level, right? right. So what men think, though, is that if I take a lot of testosterone, I'm going to raise my testosterone. My estradiol is going to keep going up, 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 up to the moon. 
that doesn't happen. It can't happen because there is a saturation effect. It's called Michaelis Minton kinetics. What happens is we only have so much of an aromatase enzyme. We all, move, all, all have so much 5-alpha reductase enzyme. Once that yeah. enzyme is fully saturated with testosterone, it can't produce any more estradiol or DHT. So right. literally, you can raise your testosterone level to the tens of thousands. Your estradiol will ride for a short period of time, and then it will plateau, and it can't rise any further. Testosterone keeps going up. Estradiol will plateau. DHT will plateau. Okay? Yep. Yep. So, so what I don't really understand is that they, they refuse to acknowledge physiology and that testosterone is basically a pro-hormone and the beneficial effects that you all read about and you all want, except for increase in muscle mass, come from its active metabolites. That's, that's, right. that's the key. And when you block those, you cause harm. So here's the other thing that I really just never understand. They want their testosterone levels to be super optimal. They want them to be great but yet they want to maintain their estradiol level in a range for a man with low testosterone levels. Yep. And I've talked about this day in and day out. I'll, I'll say it to him blue in the face, Jay, every patient that I see, every new man that I see, when I see him in follow-up, when I see that his symptoms have significantly improved, when I see that his levels are optimal and he's extremely happy with his levels and how he is feeling and functioning, I always ask this question, how are you feeling? Great. How are your levels? Doc, they're optimal. I love them. Beautiful. Thank you. Right. Well, tell me, tell me something, man. I mean, you know, you got to be having some terrible estrogen symptoms, right? <laughs> and they literally get the joke and laugh. Okay. And they're like, yeah, yeah, doc, I'm crying in the movies. My, I've got my man boots. I'm, I'm, you know, uh, you know, uh, and so they really get the joke because I don't have, and I'm going to say this again, I don't have a single male patient with so-called estrogen symptoms. Right. And there are many physicians that I associate with at Whirling Medical, for instance, they don't have any patients right. with estrogen right. symptoms. See, they're, they, they fear something they're taught to fear. When you're Keith, taught- there's no such thing. There really it's isn't. Literally it's literally made up. Really from testosterone itself. They'll say, well, I got all this swelling. And look, that's testosterone, man. That's not your estrogen. <laughs> okay. That's testosterone. So when they learn to appreciate it and understand that it provides them with cardiovascular protection, improves their sexual function, then 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 they then they don't even care. They don't care if you measure it. They right. they don't care. They don't even think about it. And we right. talked about a state of optimization is this. So all these young guys on forums and everything, they look at hormones like a stereo equalizer. They just right. need to tweak this, tweak that. So I, oh, I better. I feel good today, so I'm going to get my all my DJ all, testosterone. All so I know exactly where they are when I feel great, and so they think that you're going to manage hormones like you do a stereo equalizer, and that some way they're going to find this this state of nirvana 24/7, 365. Right. It doesn't occur, guys. Right. Everybody has good weeks, bad weeks, right. good libido, bad libido. It, it just it just it's part Keith, of they're the, looking for the sweet spot. That sweet spot. That's right. I mean, my God, you know, and so they are literally looking for the proverbial sweet spot or nirvana that does not occur. Here's Come what on, you know, it's here's, at 925. Yeah. Here's what a state of here's what a state of hormone optimization is. It's when you don't think about it anymore. Right. It's when you know your hormones are truly right. optimal. They're good levels. And when you have a good day, bad day, uh, you don't even think about your hormones anymore because you know, right. you know, like you don't think about your diet and exercise program. If you have that all right. you know, appropriate, you you know, if you do, you know if you got good nutrition, you know if you got if you're exercising an adequate amount, dude. if you know if your hormones are optimal because you're doing what you're supposed to do. When you whenever things something's not right, you don't immediately think, let me go measure my estradiol level. Let me right. go measure this, that, and the right. other. That, I don't have guys that do that. I literally do not have guys that call me. I, I think. You know, I, I feel sometimes when I'm at work, like the luckiest man in the world, you know, and I, and I mean that because I am one of those guys. And, and I know that you are too, Jay. I define what I do by, by success. And right. that success is when I get a man on the phone. Helping people. And he tells me, Doc, you have changed my Saved my life. life. Yeah. My I mean, I tell you, listen, there was Save tears. my marriage, Keith. There was tears into my eyes the other day because I was talking to a man. He was in a, obviously in, a, in his car driving 
And I said, I'm calling you for your follow-up, you know, your levels, you know, we, we went over everything. They, they were wonderful. His, his follow-up form, everything was great. And he said, man, I just really can't thank you enough. And I said, well, that's just, I mean, I really appreciate you saying that. And I, and I said, well, look, you know, initially, you know, you're, you had some concerns, your wife and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I yeah. said, well, tell me, ask, let me ask you this. What does she think about how you're doing now? Because I always try to ask about how the spouse thinks now and if they've noticed any change. And he says, well, Doc, it's funny that you asked. She's sitting right beside me. And so he put her on the phone and I said, well, you know, how's your husband? How's he doing? And she literally started crying. And she goes, man, new man. this is the man that I married. You gave, He is right. back. You know, it almost brings tears to my eyes now because awesome, I get man. to hear that almost on a, almost a daily basis. Right. And that's why I do what I do is, right. is that is that it's the, just to hear that because it, I'm telling you, if I had to show up in a clinic and it was like reading the forums right. where guys are bitching, moaning, complaining, that I, 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 insurance, I, I, I wouldn't do it. I couldn't, I could not do it. No, if I heard complaints no. all day long, I, you know, and so luckily, you know, because of my close friend and good colleague and mentor, Rousier, you know, he just, uh, you know, and people like uh, Abraham Morgan Taller, you know, if you really listen to brilliant men, and then you yep. take the time to study the literature yourself, yep. then you can have some amazing results in men and women. But, you know, some people now, Jay, let's don't get away from it, can be their own worst enemy as well. Yeah. If people don't want to do things like they're supposed to do, if they want to not eat correctly, not exercise correctly, right. and not take their hormones consistently or correctly, right. and right. then expect good results, that's not going to happen. Hey guys and gals, what's going on? If you're looking to use peptides, make sure you go to my number one source, Limitless Life Nootropics. For healing with BPC-157 and TB-500 or fat loss with ipamorelin, CGC-1295 and AOD-9604 to immunity with TA-1, thymus and alpha-1, Limitless has a huge selection. Go to LimitlessLifeNootropics.com and use my code J15 to take 15% off your purchase. I send you guys tremendous love and light. You, you, you and I both know that none of the things that we talk about in optimization are magic bullets or panaceas right. or exercise right. in a bottle or the Holy grail. Everything is contingent on you dialing in your lifestyle, but let's, let's unpack this. Cause again, we always cover stuff, you know, that sometimes we're a little too highbrow and I understand that. And, you know, it's hard to keep up, but so, a man who right now is working with a doctor who doesn't understand this, who has them on an AI or is, of course, trying to keep them constrained in that absurd, narrow, you know, range of where estradiol should be, you know, give us some clarity on why those ranges are absolutely meaningless when it comes to men on therapeutic testosterone. Well, once again, uh, when you get on testosterone in every study today, Jay, in every study that we give men testosterone and most of those studies, I mean, measure estradiol or DHT, right. okay, unless they're specifically right. looking at it for a reason. All right. Right. In every study that we give men testosterone, we raise estradiol and DHT, right? Exactly. Every one of them. That's what it does. That's how it works. Testosterone. Tissue is, effects. Like you said, it's the tissue effects deriving right. and creating benefit. Let me repeat again testosterone is essentially a pro-hormone it exerts its beneficial effects through its active tissue. metabolites at the tissue level do not interfere with testosterone's beneficial effects once you <laughs> teach men these things they tend to get it the ones that don't will stay in this persistent state of always searching wondering you know you know just never right. never really happy uh but once you got it, once you can teach a guy and look we didn't start off this way jay we readily admitted it over a decade ago. I'm blocking estradiol. I'm taking 100%. an egg by myself. You know, you, you, you're both of us, it. both of us. Of course, and it was the way I to do it. it. I didn't believe it. I tried to disprove it for two years. I took two years. You had of a belief, life. perseverance. Yes, I had it. And I tried to prove it. And the more I tried to prove it, the more it proved it right. I mean, it proved it right that you shouldn't be doing it. The more I tried to prove you should be blocking it. It proved that I shouldn't be. I look. I just That's for exactly two years right. spent that time, and and so you know, thank God that I did. You know, but, but Keith just point oh five every eighth day, and no, I'm just kidding. And that's like, you know what? Those guys that do that, that is such, such a placebo effect. That's exactly yeah, where it is. Of it is. course. I used to say this. I haven't had to say it in a long time, but there are some guys that you would treat that the that the 
hardest part of treating them is that four inches between their ears. That's their, that's the that's the part that gets them in the most trouble. They're their own worst enemy. But look, anybody that's taken 0.25 of AI <laughs> uh, once or twice a week, dude, you're not doing anything. You're, that's a placebo. Keith, it's issue. actually a mental illness because, Listen, like you said, you have created a placebo mind-controlled indoctrination effect that you have to have. Right. It. And as we know, the mind it, it is happened a very to all of us. It happened to me, Jay. Back when I was taking an AI, that's how I did it. Oh man, I feel a little bloated today, or I feel this. <laughs> I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take my AI. I took it, and, and miraculously, I felt better. Okay, so then it was my wife who said, Keith. You got to stop this stuff, man, because look, right. you know that it's not healthy. You know, you're not doing it. Have you found any study to show that you should do it? And I'm like, no. She goes, well, look, stop it. And I mean, yeah. stop it now. And I did. And I and it was hard that first month to not right. go. And then that second month, it was, you know, got a little less hard. And then all of a sudden, by the third month, it escaped my mind. You, you get busy with other things. I never thought about it again. And guess what? I never had those estrogen symptoms either. It went away. It was, it was yeah. created by mine. Okay. So for guys though, again, who are watching this and they're like, you guys are saying all this great stuff, but my doctor has still got me on, you know, 0. 0.50 or one milligram, you know, three times a week or twice a week or every other day. Like, what do you tell these guys? Do you tell them to fire their doctor? I mean, what is well, here, Here's what I would say, Jay. We have focused our, our, our testosterone therapy myths around what it's really what we've been focusing on is medical literature. We exactly. focused on the misinterpretation of medical literature and how that's right. caused harm with men and how it's deprived men. Yep. What I have to lean toward is say, look, can your doctor provide any medical literature that shows what he's doing will provide you with benefit? Right. And look, anecdotal evidence doesn't count. We right. all got anecdotal evidence. I can tell you that people come in here and tell me that, you know, coffee enemas cured the cancer, but nonetheless, <laughs> You know, we, we, I mean, I hope it does. I mean, we'll do it if it does. But the point is, is that we need medical evidence that testosterone has been used enough. Thousands of randomized control trials been used right. for decades. And in none of those wonderful studies where benefits were had, did they block estrogen? Right. It is a bodybuilding thing that crept into medical the medical practice and look it's also based on a fear of gynecomastia right 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 we, both know we should talk about that keith we need to mention that we know this that is genetic. Listen, gynecomastia is so rare i've seen two cases in over a decade it is so rare right. and look you did a right. great podcast let me shout out to you and dr anthony j yep listen guys you don't get gynecomastia i don't care how high you shoot your, your darn estradiol or testosterone if you don't have the genetic predisposition 100 don't get it you don't get it don't worry about it quit worrying about it and if you do have it if you are that un like jay if you Cut have it out especially like jay have the oh, surgery, yeah. you're cured, you can get testosterone levels where you need them to be. Exactly. Happily ever after. Happily ever Keith, after. It's still, though, mind blowing in how many doctors right now That's right. are literally using CIRMs and AIs. And again, I'm not talking shit because, like you said, we both went through that shit at certain points yeah. in times of our life because that's what the procedure and the process was. We didn't know better. But if you're still working with a doctor who's, like you said, first off, it's unlikely that you even have gyno, but if you do and your doctor is blocking it and, and then how many of these guys, by the way, say to you, yeah, but if I stop taking it, it comes back. As long as I use this 0.5 of, you know, uh, Riloxifene or what is the other one? Novadex or whatever nonsense shit these guys are on. It is absolutely mind blowing. Cut it out or stop worrying about it. Keith, it's probably another one of those examples of, like you said, where they believe it's caused by the testosterone and their mind creates it. That's right. That's right. Well, look, I mean, uh, uh, two cases, Jay, two cases, two cases. They had the surgery right. done and they're happy ever after. Exactly. Two cases, you know, and, and that's all. And I don't block estradiol. So you think I would see it all day long. I don't see it. I don't see it. It's so these guys are worrying about these fears of prostate cancer, fears of high hematocrit leading to major adverse cardiac events. Their fear of gynecomastia, a fear of estradiol when estradiol is your friend, guys. Estradiol right. is is the, the main active metabolite from testosterone that provides you with such great cardiovascular protection that improves your sexual function. I mean, it, estradiol is not the enemy. It is not the enemy. Okay, so I got to add the bonus question for you. And I talked to Kenny about this last week. When does a guy 
because we know estradiol is providing all the beneficial effects at the tissue, when do you actually want to give a guy a low dose of estradiol? A lot of men right now will use a low dose of estradiol that are on testosterone therapy. Now, you don't want to do that if you're not on testosterone therapy. Of course. Fresh your testosterone production. In fact, testosterone, I mean, estradiol can be used as androgen deprivation therapy That's for right. a man with prostate cancer. And by the way, to estradiol doesn't cause prostate cancer. We can use <laughs> estradiol to treat prostate cancer. All right. I see that all the time, too. So men that have a lot of dyslipidemia, that their lipid profile is terrible. All right. Uh, then they're using oral estradiol in these men with wonderful results in their lipids. You got to remember, guys, when you take testosterone, it is a, it's conversion into estradiol that provides you the, the improvement in your lipid right. profile. Right. And by, and by the way, you did that for me. Remember, it yeah. took you for one year to brainwash yeah. me into giving up injections for transcrotal. Right. And literally, I could never get my HDL over 39. It stayed That's there right. forever. And within three months, it went to 49, 10 yeah. point right. elevation from transcrotal, increasing DHT. And like you said, improving the lipid, the beneficial lipid effects. That's right. So, so I haven't had to use it in my clinical practice yet, as far as it, to improve lipid profile. Right. But several of my colleagues have done that with great effect. It happens all the time. Great effect, with great effect, great effect. I'm glad I haven't had to use it. Uh, but, you know, I use um, a lot of my guys use the transcrotal cream still. And that cream doesn't really have a negative effect on the HDLs like the like the, some injections right. can. Uh, but still, uh, injections or cream both work. I mean, and the injections will improve every other, you know, lipid parameter just may affect the HDLs in some men. But uh, but, I've, you know, it takes about a year or more for testosterone and things to, to really improve your lipid profile. But, you know, the other hormones like thyroid really help improve that lipid profile as well. So it's about optimizing all the hormones together. Once again, there is a synergistic effect. So that's so just, just for the record, before we end the show, and, and of course, guys, again, tier1hw.com, whether you're a male or female, go and there. Jay, and you, Jay, you brought it up. So guess what? So we, uh, so these practitioners that are giving these men estradiol, yeah, they're not growing boobs and they're having no adverse effects. Okay? Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So when does a man who has a bad lipid profile already optimized hopefully on testosterone when what is the dosage and, and again what are you looking we can for start at one or two milligrams. you start at one or two milligrams and you just titrate to, to levels and, and effect okay and and then levels and effect though would be better sex drive better well-being yeah. all the great things that actually sure. come from estradiol and that's right some men just don't produce enough that's right that's right even with testosterone it's unbelievable that guys right. don't understand because they're so lied to and brainwashed by the clinical community that estrogen is what's conferring the beneficial effects. Well, you know, it is just, it, they, it is ignoring testosterone physiology. It is wanting right. to stay in a low estradiol range for men with low testosterone levels. And it's not understanding that if we went and got everybody with high testosterone levels, just naturally high, they would have a high estradiol level to reflect right. that. That's how it right. works guys. Right. That's how it works. Everybody thinks it's testosterone, testosterone. I mean, the more testosterone, the better. Yes. On muscle tissue everywhere else. No guys, it's not right. testosterone. That's doing that. It's testosterone's yeah. active metabolites. Let me drive this home to you guys. It is testosterone's active metabolites. Do not right. block those. Are you losing the beneficial effects of testosterone at the tissue level? I don't care what your serum estradiol is. If it's, if it's 68, 78, mine, 78 or 79 last time it was measured. The bottom line is that have, doesn't have an endocrine effect. That's just what's being produced by your peripherally by the adipocytes. When you block it, the block your fat cells from producing it. You're right. blocking it in the tissues, and then you lose the benefits. Okay, but keep so a lower keep number it. on a serum level, but cause harm. All right, it's still so unbelievable because I want to share this with you. I haven't told you this even in our conversations the last couple of days. Uh, a guy did a consult with me very well-to-do guy in San Diego. He owns the biggest limo company in all of uh, Southern California. And he, you know, is one of those guys where he wanted to book with Ramasami. Mm -hmm. And then Ramasami said to go to this guy. And I won't name this guy's name, but this guy was probably at the freaking conference, dude. He's like one of the biggest sexual wellness urologists in the world. And you know what? He, he literally, so this guy started with a bullshit testosterone booster. It doesn't matter. Causes his hair to fall out. He has no androgenic alopecia in his family. He's got a thick, full head of hair. So again, who knows what was in that booster? But the guy in the sexual wellness, famous urologist, sexual wellness expert, 
He came in, Nick, uh, Nick, uh, Keith, with a six sensitive estradiol, probably from the supplement. Who knows what was in it? And the guy wanted to put him on an AI. Yeah. 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 I mean, how is that even possible? Well, Jay, I didn't want to have to bring this up. I wasn't going to, but I was at that Androgen Society conference. And I was in the room, all of us together with the most brilliant urologists right. in the in the country, all around the world. Okay. Same guys, probably guys you were talking about were there. Yep. So um <laughs> we're looking at some studies, and of course, I talked about all the wonderful studies that we saw where they didn't use an AI. But it came up, Dr. Morgan Toller was leading a talk. We were just on a case con- study, but he yep. just happened to ask, well, how many of you guys in here use an aromatase inhibitor as part of your practice? And half the room raised their hand. Unbelievable. But yet they had all sit there, the sat world. there and witnessed and witnessed no study using it. Okay. They also are all there. And there's just an article written in the aging mail on management of testosterone and side effects and everything. And specifically in that paper, it says, do not block estradiol. It was written by, uh, it was written by Morgan Toller and the other urologists, some of them that were there. And it said, do not use non-aromatizable androgens and do not block estradiol because of its beneficial effects on X, Y, Z. It just listed in the paper. And this is a brand new paper from 2021 on guidelines for the treatment of testosterone. Unbelievable. In men. And so, and it's a wonderful paper, by the way, it's in the AG mail. I'll send it to you. Uh, yep. But they specifically say there's no data that supports blocking estradiol. And, and still 50% of the best guys in the world are blocking it. Best guys, 50% of the best guys. Also, <laughs> Jay, listen, this is why I'm not really, this is why I'm not really excited about where this world is going because <laughs> we presented a case control study of a man that had a Gleason six prostate cancer, which right. is the lowest grade, basically lowest right. grade. Uh, perfectly good to be on active surveillance and take testosterone therapy. So he had a level of 300 and something of testosterone. His free testosterone level was not adequate. But the room was asked, how many men would treat this man with testosterone? Only half the room raised their hand. Unbelievable, man. Okay. And yet Morgan Toller did say, well, you know what? That's certainly an improvement from two years ago. They didn't have a meeting last year. 100% probably. Yeah. Yeah. So so now at least half the room raised their hand. But really, you would think that everybody in that room would raise their hand because they just witnessed all the studies showing that it's safe. But yeah, they should know better. They're trained. They were trained whenever it was not safe and they can't right. break out of that, those yeah. chains. They can't break out of those chains. It's like you said to me a long time ago, medicine is so full of inertia. It's like a gigantic barge in the ocean. It can't turn around for 50 years. Right. It, it's terrible. It, it, it is terrible. And, and it's, it's, uh, it, it is what it is. So, uh, so. It, well, yeah. well, I mean, look, man, you and I and Neil and Morgan Taylor and all these guys, you know, that have the bully pulpit. We, it's our job, dude. Like we have to get out here and we have to let people know that there is a better way. And again, I'll just say this, his website's right there. He works with pretty much anybody in the world, in the country. You know, there are obviously restrictions at different country levels and stuff, but he can still do a telemedicine consult with you. Stop fucking up your health. Stop listening to physicians who have you on AIs. Stop listening to physicians who are literally phlebotomizing you to death dropping, fucking up your iron count, giving you anemia, lack of energy. I mean, dude, you and I have heard it all. Stop working with people who do not use the evidence at the practice level. Stop it. There will be people. What else can you do? That will argue to your blue in the face that because they still will have this fear that it might, but it never has. What they're doing is all I'm trying to say today is, when we are doing things like that, me included, guys, I was doing that too. Of course. When we do things like that, yep. okay, when we fear that testosterone is going to cause prostate cancer, when, we, when we're using phlebotomies to lower hematocrit for secondary erythrocytosis, right. when we're blocking estradiol, we're right. not doing what the medical literature shows. That's exactly right. Okay. And just like with why well, we've deprived men for decades of testosterone due to the, the, you know, the study we overinterpreted in 1941. So, guys, right. when you're doing that, there is actually a better way, a healthier way. Yeah. All right. Honestly, bro. I mean, final thought just to add in, I mean, and we're not going to rabbit hole on it, but it's the same thing with metformin. Metformin 
will destroy your kidneys. I mean, they taught them that from a study that was extrapolated also in the in the mid to late 30s. And right. every guy in med school in first or second year was told that you can never use metformin because it'll destroy their kidneys. And think about how many people are deprived of that amazing drug right. you know, to extend life because of the same shit. Keith, man, I love you. This has been a profound podcast. Uh, if somebody is watching this, you know, there's two parts to this. And they want to work with you. They want to podcast with you. They want to connect with you. Other than going to the website, is there anything else you want to tell? No, just give us a call at uh, Tier One Health and Wellness. Uh, we're, you know, you can Google Google Tier One Health and Wellness, and numbers all there. So, uh, you know, or you can, you know, there's a website right there. A website, new website is in development. A lot of new, uh, you know, information will be coming out in the next couple of months. But you know, as Jay knows, we're we're getting that that new website up and going. So hopefully, get guys a lot of good information out there. Do a lot of good, a lot of new. Uh, educational videos on, on exactly what we've been talking about today and some slide presentations just so I can continue to present the medical evidence. Okay. That's, That's awesome. what we want to stick with is the medical evidence. And remember guys, our book will be out hopefully by the end of this year, if not first quarter of next year. And I promise you, I guarantee you it will be the book that ends all books. Nothing ever will come beyond it. If it is, we'll, we'll edit it and update if something new comes. But I mean, again, this is like, as Keith knows, uh, something that's been coming for five years. So again, Keith, love you. Appreciate you. You guys you support too. the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell podcast. Go to tier one HW.com. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. I will see all of you guys very soon.